Welcome to this episode of Destination Dare. Every community in the Outer Banks has a story to tell, and this show brings that information to life. From Dare County history to current events, from government services to local profiles, we keep you entertained, informed, and up to date. Hello, I'm Melissa Dickerson, the town planner for the town of Manio. As part of my job as town planner, I'm also the town's floodplain administrator. The town of Manio, located on Roanoke Island, is surrounded by water. Shalabag Bay, the Roanoke Sound, and the Croatan Sound can all cause tidal flooding that can inundate the town of Manio. Heavy rains, tropical storms, and hurricanes have all affected the town in recent years. Due to frequent flooding, residents need to be aware of the potential flooding that can occur. Flooding is one of the town's most frequent hazards. The town has quite a history of floods. The weather tower located near the Roanoke Marshes Lighthouse has a high water mark from Hurricane Irene, which hit in 2011. That high water mark from NOAA notes that the floodwaters from Hurricane Irene was seven feet and 11 inches above mean sea level. When weather conditions are likely to cause flooding, the town staff monitor conditions in flood prone areas. Staff also prepare for potential flooding by staging barricades and deploying high water signs. When possible, the town also sends emergency alerts notifying community members of the potential risk of flooding. You can sign up for those emergency alerts by visiting the town's website at www.manionc.gov. When flooding occurs, do not enter flood waters. Turn around, don't drown. The town of Manio has a no-wake ordinance for its streets. This means that when streets are flooded, it is illegal to drive on those flooded streets. There's a $250 fine for violating this ordinance. This law is intended to keep the public safe. As well, when vehicles travel along flooded streets, the wake caused by that traffic can slosh and cause flooding in businesses or residents located along flooded streets. The Town of Manio participates in the National Flood Insurance Program, which is a federally subsidized program that enables property owners to purchase flood insurance in return for community adoption of specific flood damage reduction planning and building criteria. The Town of Manio has been a participant in the flood insurance program since 1973. This insurance is required for property owners who are located in a designated special flood hazard area and have a federally backed mortgage. For more information on the requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program, contact Planning Department staff. The Town of Manio also participates in FEMA's Community Rating System, which is a voluntary program associated with the National Flood Insurance Program. Communities can conduct activities beyond the minimum requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program to provide property owners with reduced flood insurance premiums. Manio is very active in this program, and as a result, the town's property owners receive a 15% reduction in flood insurance premiums. Insure your property. Flood damage is not covered by your homeowner's insurance. Don't wait until it's too late. The National Flood Insurance Program guidelines require a 30-day waiting period from the date of purchase to the time a flood insurance policy goes into effect. Call your insurance agent to discuss your flood coverage or visit www.floodsmart.gov for more information. New flood maps for the town of Manio were adopted and effective on June 19th of 2020. The town's board of commissioners adopted a new flood damage prevention ordinance along with the flood maps. The flood damage prevention ordinance regulates development in the town to improve the risk of flood damage to properties. Keep your flood insurance. Over 500 properties were removed from the special flood hazard area in Manio under the new flood maps. It's important to note that flood maps only depict those areas subject to a 1% annual chance of flooding and do not reflect other flooding sources such as heavy rainfall or elevated groundwater levels. Floods can happen anywhere. Natural hazards and storms are a part of living on Roanoke Island and the sustainability of our community depends on managing flood hazards from all sources. The town of Manio takes flooding risk very seriously. We are here to help you determine the risk to your property and help you mitigate that risk. 
We have documents provided by FEMA that may guide you in making appropriate property protection decisions for your property and your families. Please feel free to call us with any flood-related questions you may have at 252-473-4112. One thing about fishing piers, we're kind of a bleacher seat to the fishing industry. We're the, we're the place where kids go for the first time. They'll rent a rod, uh, we have bait and everything else. We show them how to use it, and a lot of times they'll catch their first fish. And uh, that's a real thrill, going out there and watching a kid yelling and screaming, caught his first fish, and, and uh, we take pictures of it. But it's, uh, it's really neat. My name's Gary Oliver. I own the Outer Banks Pier. I've, I've been here for 50 years now, which is hard to believe. Piers in North Carolina, have played an important role along the coast in all the towns. They've been kind of the focal point. There used to be 30 piers along the coast, now we're down to less than 20. And part of that is due to uh, erosion and storms. And it's tough to maintain a pier, and, but uh, I've been lucky. We've been, with 50 years I've been here, we've had the number of storms. Hurricane Isabel, we lost the most. But uh, we've been able to repair it, keep it going, and it's, uh, it's been a joy. One of the great things about fishing piers is that they, they create their own ecosystem, their own habitat. They actually attract the things that the fishermen are interested in. So barnacles grow on the pilings. The fish that eat those barnacles hover around the pilings and the fish that eat those fish, the large game fish, move in. And that's what encourages fishermen to want to fish from fishing piers. Our goal is to encourage more people to care about and respect nature by putting them in touch with it on a daily basis. Here at Jeanette's Pier, we do that through fishing, education, and research. We promote ethical angling, catch and release, and taking only what you're going to eat that day so that you can come back tomorrow and do it all over again. We also encourage an appreciation of other wildlife that we see on a daily basis here, our sea turtles, shorebirds, and marine mammals. My name is Brian Kearns, I'm the general manager at Nags Head Fishing Pier. We have a great diversity of fish located on this pier, which is kind of phenomenal throughout the year. Starts off in about May, we usually get a lot of speckled trout, some sea mullets and stuff like that. Later in the year, our big fish show up with our, you know, cobias, king mackerels, which do pin rigging on the end of the pier. Later in the year, you know, it goes into drum fishing, which is in October, which is one of the big draws. The Outer Banks is one of the drum capitals of the world. It's one of the few places you can come down and catch, you know, 40, 50 pound, giant class bull redfish. You can come out, you can catch what you want, have a good time, make some memories with your family. Back in the 70s, we had a lot of farmers and we had just a lot of people, they needed to catch fish to put in their freezers. Well, now it's more of an activity. It's not, it's not something that they do to feed themselves. So there's been a big change. And, and you know, I've seen, I've had a congressman out there fishing next to a guy who was homeless. You know, it's just, we get people from all walks of life. One of our favorite things about fishing piers is that they originally were cultural and social centers of the community. The North Carolina Aquariums felt it was important to preserve this place here at Jeanette's Pier because we didn't want to lose that cultural and social center. Obviously, it's important to maintain access to the recreational fishery. The advantage of fishing piers is that we do that at an affordable price so an entire family can enjoy a day on the water. You do not have to have a fishing license to fish off the pier. We have a blanket license that's provided to you, the fee that you pay to come on the pier. If you only want to try to fish for a day, have a day you know, where you don't have anything else to do, you want to spend it outside over top of the water with a beautiful atmosphere, a beautiful view. You don't need to go buy a fishing license. You can come down. We offer all of that to you free of charge. We also have everything you would need to get exactly what you want to have done. That's one of the uh, really good things about a pier is the people you see every year, year after year, the same group come back and forth. I've got fourth generations now coming down to the pier. I'm getting older, <laughs> but it's great. I've enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's been a, a great uh, thrill for me to be here.
My name is Rachel Tackett and I'm the Public Information Officer for the Town of Kildevil Hills. As a PIO, I'm responsible for internal and external communications. So internally with our employees and governing board and externally with our citizens, the media, the county and other area PIOs. The PIO is a familiar first line link between the town government and the community. My job is to relay information from the town to the public and vice versa. I typically work Monday through Friday, eight to five. My day usually involves a lot of written and verbal communication. I'm constantly writing email updates, replying to emails, creating social media posts and responding to the comments there, writing employee newsletters and press releases. When I'm not writing, I'm usually on the phone answering general calls from the public information requests from the media, and corresponding with other departments in the town. You may also see me around the town snapping photos, visiting a project site, or alongside our emergency personnel during an event. There are times when my work hours are dramatically different, and that's during emergencies, like an extreme weather event or a widespread pandemic. When emergencies happen, I'm working around the clock, coordinating with others to get accurate information and updates so they can be provided to anyone who may be affected by the situation. That being said, every day is different and I have to remain ready and prepared to change work priorities in a given second. In this day and age, uh, with so much information that's out there on social media, in the news or on the internet or whatever the case may be, who knows what's true, what's not true. It's important for the town to have that public information officer to communicate current, accurate, timely, and critical information pertaining to public safety in order to keep our community as safe as possible. Especially during times of emergencies when we have hurricanes, tornadoes, weather events, um, it's good to have someone specifically designated to get the information out to show the town, that our community, what's going on, how we're preparing, and how we're gonna to respond to and recover from these type of incidents. Another part of my job is sharing positive, fun, exciting projects and activities that happen here in Kill Devil Hills. We always have a lot going on here in town and it's important to let our citizens know about it. I use various communication methods to reach our citizens some of which include the town's website and social media channels. We have a Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Our email updates, press releases, radio PSAs, the government access channel, the town's emergency alerts and beach safety alerts system, and even simpler methods like signs at the park or at the beach accesses. A big component of my job is to build and grow networks with other employees, the public, and the media. Whether it's coordinating and attending a townwide event like Santa at Town Hall, stopping by the dog park to engage with its visitors, or answering our business community's needs by delivering resource materials, I do my best to establish a channel of personal communication and be a recognizable face and voice of knowledge and authority that people can rely on. I frequently work to improve my professional development by completing both online and in-person FEMA trainings, attending communication courses through the UNC Chapel Hill School of Government, and networking with other PIOs both in the area and across the country. Continuing my education helps me to provide the highest level of service to our community. To stay informed with the latest news in Kill Devil Hills, visit our website, kdhnc.com. There you can sign up to receive regular email updates and also for emergency alerts. Also, check out our Facebook page, which is facebook.com backslash town of kdh, our Instagram page, or you can visit our YouTube channel, town of kdh. It's a beautiful day to be on the beach in Kitty Hawk, but if you want your beach day to be safe and pleasant for everyone, there's a few rules and safety tips you Cut. should...
<laughs> What's wrong? Well, the weather app says it's about to start pouring. We'll never get through all these beach rules. There's just a few rules, but we'll get through. Nah, it's cool. We can do all this on green screen. Let's get out of here. Action. It's a beautiful day on the beach in Kitty Hawk. No, we We're got that. Just take it from the rules. Um, okay. Town ordinances prohibit glass bottles, fires, and driving on the beach in Kitty Hawk. Also, beach items and equipment cannot be unattended or left out overnight. That includes umbrellas, volleyball nets, chairs, cabanas. No, and you know what? Does that beach look real to you? I don't know, man. It looks pretty real to me. Let's stop raining. Maybe we should go back out. Or... That includes umbrellas, volleyball nets, chairs, and cabanas. Motorized watercraft such as jet skis cannot be launched from the Atlantic Ocean. You know, maybe the green screen was all right after all. Digging holes and mounding sand on the beach is not allowed, as it is unsafe to beachgoers, rescue personnel, and sea life. Oh, I got an idea. Beach safety is no laughing matter. Always swim where the lifeguard can see you. If the red flags are out, it is illegal to swim, and you could be fined for it. If you see lightning... Hang if on! It, if you see lightning or hear thunder, get out of the water and off of the sand. Dude, that lightning looks so real! Make sure you know what beach access you are at. If you need to call 911, they need to know where to find you. Know what to do if you are caught in a rip current. Break the grip of the rip by swimming parallel to the beach. Or if you can't do that, just float and wait for help to come to you. Oh, you know what? Protect your neck by always entering the water feet first. Do not try to- Don't we have an infographic of this too? <laughs> Don't we should just dare. head back and- Testing. Do not float where you cannot swim, and always supervise children who are in or near the water. These are just a few rules and tips to keep you and your family safe. So come on out and enjoy the blissfully tranquil waters of the Kitty Hawk Beach. I know I am. <laughs> We as town staff process applications associated with the town's historic landmarks program. We process designation applications, which are requests to designate properties as historic landmarks. And we process applications for certificates of appropriateness, which are requests to make exterior improvements to properties that have been designated as historic landmarks. 23 Porpoise Run was the first property to be designated as a historic landmark. Since then, we've had five additional designations. We hope to add more as more properties become eligible to satisfy the 50-year-old criteria. We're at 23 Porpoise Run. This house was built in 1958. It's built of concrete block, and the story goes that they made the concrete block from uh, shells that they ground down in Kitty Hawk Village, and a lot of the flat tops were done that way. Here's the living room with a nice fireplace. You can see the cool texture. The ceiling, I believe, is pine. This is just very typical of the way these cottages were built for people back in the early 60s and late 50s. You'll find two bedrooms and a bath. Not a lot of space, but back then it was just about getting people to the beach and enjoying everything that the ocean had to provide and seafood dinners and family. Okay, we're going into another addition to the house um, that was added that just really increased the comfort and livability of this home. Outside it would appear as part of the original structure because it's a flat roof and, and just blends right in with the original structure. Juniper walls, screen porch was just a must have for all these flat tops that were built in the 50s and 60s as it was a prime gathering spot for families to pick crabs, play cards, and just unwind after a day at the beach or fishing or surfing. I purchased this cottage because I love the flat top architecture and I love things that may have or do have historical relevance. It's cool in the summertime and warm in the wintertime. Um, it is one of the historic landmarks. 
This property really demonstrates Frank Stick's classic design, including the 18 inch uh, overhang that goes around the entire house. The whitewashed exterior, which is now this beautiful light blue. So all of these things were kind of built on this concept that was developed in Florida and brought up here. The Historic Landmarks Commission, I think, is important because it's a way to preserve some of the historic significance and character of the town of Southern Shores. I hope that more homes will be designated historic. Um, please consider your cottage. Hello, I'm Donna Black, Chief of Duck Fire Department. And I'm Jeff Ackerman, Chief of Police for the Town of Duck. And together, we work to provide essential services for the residents, businesses, and visitors of Duck. We're here to give you a quick look at some of the ways police officers and firefighters continue to master skills, take on leadership and training roles, and shine in their professional communities. We are so proud of our staff and volunteers for the jobs they do every day. But you might be wondering, what does professional development look like for our public safety officers? I'm most proud of our officers here at Duck Police Department because 100% of them hold an advanced law enforcement certificate. That is virtually unheard of at any other agency, uh, and especially an agency of our size to be able to tout that level of accomplishment. And an advanced uh, certification requires thousands of hours of law enforcement training, um, in conjunction with their years of service and then also their academic performance. It says a lot. It shows our officers are continually willing to learn, be aware of the newest policing techniques and everything that uh, comes from that. It also helps to reduce our liability considerably having well-trained officers. I think it's really important for our volunteers and our career staff to continue to train and learn and develop professionally. Within our region, we can work together. That's another form of professional development. If we're all practicing and training together, how we bring the best service back to our citizens. I'm Missy Clark. I'm a patrol lieutenant for the Town Duck Police Department. Um, currently, I serve as one of our SCAT instructors, which is subject control arrest techniques. And that's really important for me because that's how our officers are um, work on their safety skills, work on how to deal with things so that they are safe, that the individual is safe, and also I have the advantage of teaching in our basic program through the BLAT program and teaching new recruits and hopefully giving them the skills necessary to keep them safe while they're on the street. Fire Life Safety Educator 1 certified, Inspector 1 certified, Instructor 2 certified, and Fire Officer 2. In earnest, I've been working on those certifications for about the past 12 years. Sometimes when you just get training within your own community, you get pigeonholed into some of the uh, practices that are most common. However, in other communities, a lot of times those practices are not the most common. And that variety of training is what gives you the completeness of your education. I currently hold a general certificate for instructor. I think it's important to be able to communicate with the members of the community. And going through some of these trainings and learning how to communicate more effectively, I think that helps the relationship between the police and the community. I am very familiar with the license plate reader systems that we have. Um, a lot of the towns come to me for information from that. I get multiple phone calls every month from officers asking for tips on how to use the system, as well as training all their officers up on how to use the system more effectively. I came from Dare County EMS um, and still hold my advanced EMT certification. And then also have state technical rescue certs and rope rescue and uh, vehicle machinery rescue, as well as uh, ocean rescue. I feel like it's important to just stay up to date in different areas and bring different aspects to the job from, from other areas. My new position as second VP of the IAFC. That's my professional development now. As a chief, I'm going to look for different opportunities to bring back different ideas to our department, our region, 
And I got to find that now in a more global sense. I'm not taking the fire officer one. I've taken all that kind of stuff. Now I need to focus more on what my development is to bring back more as a chief. What can I bring back to the community from a leadership role? In society in general, everything moves so quickly now. So it's vitally important for our officers to continue training throughout their career. Our officers typically spend 100 to 150 hours a year in both in-service training and then advanced level training. So that allows them to keep at the forefront of modern policing, more forefront of community policing techniques. So it's, it makes better police officers, better trained officers or better police officers. On this delicate sandbar, emergencies happen every day and tough decisions need to be made. Most days, those decisions are made by first responders who take action and solve problems quickly using the authority and resources they have at hand. But what happens when an emergency exceeds their capabilities or has the potential to bring widespread impacts to a town or across the entire county? Impacts could come from anywhere, a storm, a man-made disaster, a public health crisis, an act of terror, civil unrest, or a chemical release, just to name a few. When we are facing widespread or severe damage, injury, or loss of life or property, how are decisions made to keep our community safe? In North Carolina, counties and towns operate under authority granted by state statute. For emergencies, North Carolina General Statute 166A, the Emergency Management Act, provides the authority and responsibility that local governments have to prevent, prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. The Act defines an emergency as an occurrence or imminent threat of widespread or severe damage, injury or loss of life or property resulting from any natural or man-made threat or hazard. Counties are responsible for emergency management efforts to include coordinating activities with towns. To meet this responsibility, counties and towns establish emergency management agencies, expend funds to keep people and property safe, implement emergency management plans, provide emergency management response resources, and declare local states of emergency when needed to ensure public health and safety. The county or a town will declare a local state of emergency when they believe an emergency exists or is imminent. In DARE, each town in the county have an emergency management ordinance that designates the authority to declare a state of emergency to the town's mayor, the chair of the board of commissioners, or their designee. While these individuals have the authority to declare a state of emergency, and impose prohibitions and restrictions, they need the best information available to make the best possible decisions to protect public health and safety. When an emergency has occurred or is looming on the horizon, we turn to our emergency operations plan. The plan, required by Chapter 92 of the Dare County Code, provides a framework that brings decision makers, subject matter experts, and others together to share information and coordinate decision making. In the plan, we use the term senior leaders to identify decision makers who have the authority to declare a local state of emergency and impose restrictions and prohibitions. The term is also used to describe others who have authorities they can use independently to protect public health and safety. The National Park Superintendent and the Dare County Sheriff have authorities outside of the Emergency Management Act, making them key senior leaders who routinely collaborate and coordinate actions with the chair of the Dare County Board of Commissioners and our town mayors. When challenges arise and actions are needed to ensure public health and safety, our senior leaders, along with other key personnel, come together. 
They meet either in person or virtually and receive briefings from subject matter experts on what to expect, ways to mitigate impacts, and how best to protect our community. While we always focus on ensuring public health and safety, we never set aside how actions taken impact business and community activities. Often senior leaders will reach out to key partners and community leaders to gather information and keep them informed as tough decisions are made. Depending on the circumstance, a state of emergency may be declared. While no one wants to impose prohibitions and restrictions, we know that without them, those we serve may be put unnecessarily in harm's way. While each senior leader has independent authority, either from the Emergency Management Act or other statutes that allows them to take actions on their own, they always strive to reach consensus. Once decisions are made, they are captured in a written state of emergency declaration that is quickly communicated to the public and implemented. As the situation changes, decision makers are briefed and if changes are needed, the declaration is updated with prohibitions and restrictions being added or removed. These efforts continue until the emergency no longer threatens public health and safety. When an emergency crosses jurisdictional boundaries or is anticipated to bring widespread impacts to the county, a state of emergency may be signed by the chair of the Board of Commissioners, outlining all decisions and detailing who provided consent. Often towns will issue their own declaration signed by their mayor. At times, a declaration may be issued by just the county or a town. Just like the everyday decisions made by a lifeguard, a law enforcement officer, a firefighter, an emergency medical technician, or a 911 call taker to save lives and protect property, senior leaders are empowered to take action to ensure public health and safety when our community is facing widespread or severe damage, injury, or loss of life or property. These are tough decisions made with the best information available from subject matter experts and key stakeholders that lead to actions that protect our community until emergency conditions are no longer present. For more information, visit www.darenc.com slash emergency management. <laughs>